Hello, you cool cats. TJ English is a journalist, screenwriter, and New York Times bestselling author. His newest is another excellent read. It's called Dangerous Rhythms, Jazz in the Underworld. TJ, thank you for the time. How you doing today? I'm doing good. It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure's all mine. So what was your goal with Dangerous Rhythms? Oh, the um, goal with Dangerous Rhythms. Um, well, you know, I'd, I'd been wanting to do this book for a long time. It was sort of in my back pocket for decades. I was uh, a fan of the music. I've been a fan of the music since I was a teenager. And, uh, you know, when you're when you're a jazz fan, it's not just the music, it's the culture around the music. It's the history. Uh, everything is part of the experience of, of being an aficionado of jazz. So um, being a fan of the music, I read I read books about the music, uh, biographies of specific musicians. And I was, you know, made aware of this history. Um, it was mentioned here and there, the relationship between the clubs, the mob controlled clubs and the musicians. Uh, but very few people were willing to talk openly about it for a long time. Um, it wasn't until the mobsters were dead and gone that a lot of the old time musicians like Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway and Count Basie did memoirs where they mentioned it. Um, so I knew this history was there and I knew that there was a lot more to explore than what was coming out in the public domain. So I'd had it in mind for a long time to do this, to do this book. Um, the time finally arrived and then of course COVID hit mm. and right in the middle of uh, researching this book. So I was kind of on lockdown for a while, um, but that was wonderful because I found out that you can do a tremendous amount of archival research these days, right online. You don't necessarily have to go to the locations I went to all these cities at one point or another, however, even before I started research on this book. So the obvious cities like New Orleans and Chicago and New York and Los Angeles, everywhere I go, I kind of burrow into the local jazz history and go to the local jazz clubs. Um, so it was a wonderful thing to have during COVID to muck around in this history and spend time with the spirits of Duke Ellington and Count Basie and all of that. Um, this is a long-winded. This is a long-winded answer to your question, but um, I think the primary goal of it was to get below the surface of it, to get at the roots of this relationship and attempt to understand it and explain it in a way that had never been really explained before. And of course, that requires you to go back to the very beginning to understand the roots for each. And jazz more or less got its start in the early 1900s, around 1912. And New Orleans really is the birthplace of jazz. Some say that this genre was inspired by a desire to come up with an entirely new language. But you say it goes much deeper than that. How so, TJ? Yeah, I asked myself this question a lot when I first started this book. Where did jazz come from? Um, it was such a revolutionary and extraordinary development, unprecedented in many ways, certainly musically unprecedented in the United States. And I read the history books and I, I, I read a lot about it. And um, the explanations were kind of unsatisfying, to be honest. Um, they explained it musically, how it, how it, how it, the various sources that led into the beginnings of jazz. But I, I just felt like there needed to be more, and this led me to this, uh, I think, historical discovery. Um, I so if you look at the history, you say what's happening in the culture in the thirty or thirty years or so leading up to the creation of jazz. What 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 is happening in the culture for African Americans in particular? Um, and there's one obvious thing that jumps out, and that is this long reign of terror known as the period of lynching, that had been ongoing for about 30 years. It was especially prevalent in the state of Louisiana, where New Orleans is and where jazz began. And I just felt like you know, you can't ignore that. Uh, long legacy of violence that leads up to the creation of the music. 
so it's relevant in terms of I think jazz as a reaction to this this reign of terror, jazz as a way to reorder the universe in a way to create an expression of life and joy uh, that is totally new and unprecedented as a reaction to this horror of 30 years of violence. It also explains, most importantly in, in, in relation to the book I've just published, why the musicians would be willing so willing to partner with underworld figures who were running the clubs. Well, I think the, the answer to that is, and I say it in the book, the average jazz musician had less to fear from a mafiosi than he did from a white cracker out on the street or a policeman. So this was the reality. This was the cultural reality for jazz musicians as they embarked on the development of this new music. And, um, that explained a lot to me. That was important. That was to, to understand why the musicians would partner with so-called violent underworld figures. I think you have to look at it in that context and see that there was an element of protection that was provided by the mob controlled clubs that made it um, preferable to, to the musicians at the time. And many may not realize this, but there was a sort of shared quality of ostracization oftentimes between those gangsters in the late 1800s and early 1900s that allowed a sort of camaraderie between those Italian and oftentimes Sicilian men who ended up owning the clubs and and employing these jazz musicians, especially in New Orleans. How did a slew of lynchings in 1891 at the Parish Prison in Louisiana really help create a bond between black musicians and Sicilian club owners, TJ? Right. One of the biggest uh, incidents of lynching in history at that time in 1891 were uh, a number of Italian Americans who were rounded up. The, the very popular police chief in New Orleans was murdered and the city forefathers were convinced that it was uh, done by the mafia. And so they rounded up Sicilians and put them on trial and they were found not guilty. But this was not uh, sufficient to the masses who had been sort of stirred up in a kind of anti-Sicilian fervor during the trial so that when they were acquitted, the people rose up, they broke into the local courthouse and the local prison and they dragged these men out into the street and they lynched them in the town square. Well, this was a shocking event that got a lot of attention all over the world, really, but certainly all over the United States. And um, it had a lot of consequences. One of them was um, in many ways, it was the beginning of the mafia as a secret society in the United States. There had been the Black Hand, the Sicilian Black Hand, up until that point. But I think uh, Italian Americans looked at what occurred there and the level of hostility directed towards them. And it, it reconfigured the development of the mafia. In some ways, I think it was a it was a boon to the mafia as a secret society. I mean, it was a major hit to begin with, with all those uh, lynchings. But the response to it was to formulate um, a, a, a more uh, effective secret society um, so that the population at large or the culture at large wouldn't even know what the mafia was up to. And also, I think, for the African-American musicians who were part of who were enveloped in the legacy of lynching um, saw this as a kind of a bonding, a perverse bonding mechanism between the Sicilian club owners and the African-American musicians, a kind of level of camaraderie and understanding there born out of that tragedy. But you also mentioned another point that's very important um, about how the early jazz world was a melding of the outcasts, the African-Americans and the immigrant class, the Sicilians and the Italians and the Jews and the Irish, uh, in contrast to the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant establishment. Jazz was attacked in the papers. Jazz was attacked by the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant establishment as vice music, music from the gutter. And so Jazz becomes a bonding element for the immigrant class and African-Americans at large. And um, 
this also was kind of a terrifying development to the city forefathers and the law enforcement who saw the, the melding of the immigrant class and African-Americans, the children of slaves, as a threat, as something to fear and something to see as a dangerous thing. And these clubs and this music really got their start in vice districts, first in New Orleans with Storyville and eventually throughout the country uh, because they were just in some sad way trying to put all the D-Gens together. And uh, out of that, we got some great nicknames, if nothing else. Some would argue that the name Jazz came from the brothels and uh, giving a slightly different uh, slightly different pronunciation to the word jizz, but you have a, a slightly different take on how the word jazz came to be. How, so how did, uh, according to your research, the, the t- word jazz come to be? Well, it first started as jazz, J-A-S-S. That was the spelling of it in the in the papers. And then it became jazz. I don't know. I don't have any inside track on that. There's a lot of different theories about the term jazz. The interesting thing about that is I mean, it was mostly a marketing term. It was a way to promote the music. In later years, a lot of jazz musicians came to resent the term or not like the term at all. Uh, they felt it was marginalized the music. Um, there's a lot of people who just think that that music should be called American classical music because mm. uh, that's basically what it is. It doesn't so quite term... roll off the tongue as well, though. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, yeah. Um, so what's exciting about um, so when the immigrant class connects and we start to get the music in the clubs, which becomes the preferred uh, arena to experience this music, because American society is not accepting it at the at the level of cultural institutions. You're not going to hear much jazz in uh, music academies or in universities that. That's all European music, classical European music. Jazz is the people's music. It's rising up out of the streets. And so when the Sicilians and the mobsters start to get their hooks into it as a business proposition, the clubs become the way to disseminate the music. And the clubs become hugely popular for lovers of jazz. And they infuse uh, a culture, a kind of culture where you go to hear the music in the honky tonks And of course, this is all put on steroids in 1919 when prohibition goes into effect. Prohibition goes into effect throughout the 1920s, what uh, historians refer to as the jazz age. This is when this relationship between the the underworld, the mob and the musicians really reaches new heights. Um, Jazz, you know, every speakeasy in the major cities probably has a small jazz trio or quartet in the speakeasy, the larger clubs like the Cotton Club and the Plantation Club, these kind of clubs, they have large orchestras. And it's the money from illegal booze that fuels the the possibility of having large orchestras. The, The ability to finance that sort of configuration is connected to the underworld. So we often get into this conversation, would jazz have happened without its connections to organized crime, particularly as it relates to the prohibition era. And I always say, yes, the music I think was undeniable and was going to take shape in some manner or another. But it's also very clear that the economics of the underworld in the 1920s made it possible for jazz to explore all sorts of levels of development that might not have happened otherwise. Yeah, there's an example from Kansas City around this time that I think uh, plays nicely into the idea that jazz may have taken a different path, but the path that it took, it was certainly taking advantage of what was in front of it, sometimes literally involving uh, various sexual obscenities. Before that, though, I needed to ask about Jelly Roll Morton, still one of the all-time great jazz musicians, really one of the first jazz musicians to make a name for himself in New Orleans. Where'd the nickname come from, TJ? And what was it about Jelly Roll that made him so beloved by a wider audience? Well, Jelly Roll is a term referring to the vagina, Um you know, Jelly Roll was, I guess the, the more colloquial word would be pussy. Jelly Roll was, was, uh, was another way of saying pussy. Jelly Roll Morton was a, was a pimp. So that's how he got that 
that terminology. He started out as a piano player in the Bordellos in Storyville. And this is one of the tributaries that jazz comes from. He was playing, I guess, what would primarily be referred to as ragtime when he first started out. But um, he was expanding the parameters of the music right there in the foyer of the Bordello where he where he played the piano. He was an incredibly inventive artist. I mean, he was taking jazz and he was creating, he was composing the music, writing lyrics, singing it. Uh, he created many of the first jazz standards, songs that we would call standards that everybody played for decades afterwards and in many cases still play. He was a raffish street character. He looked kind of like a elegant sewer rat. He had a diamond tooth and he, <laughs> he had his hair back. He was light skinned, he was Creole. And you know, the Creoles had a major role to play in the development of jazz. People like Sidney Bechet and Jelly Roll Morton were among the founding fathers of the music as it rose up out of New Orleans. I think the thing about him is he was, was such a brilliant artist but also the entertainment factor. He was a great entertainer, um, showmanship, a certain amount of showmanship. I think this is what was learned by old people like Fats Waller and a lot of great jazz entertainers who came after Jelly Roll Morton. They realized that if this music is going to qualify as live entertainment, it has to not only capture the imagine musically, but it has, has to provide a certain level of joy and and wonder and fun and jelly roll morton was nothing if not fun the controlling influence of a lot of these clubs and really all the goings-ons around town around this time in new orleans and eventually kansas city when the sicilian influence continued to expand up there was something called the sicilian black hand what was this well the black hand is kind of a precursor to the mafia um it's when waves of Sicilians first started to come to the United States. It was kind of a tradition that was brought from the old country. It was a tradition of extortion. I guess extortion disguised as protection is how it was usually uh, negotiated. You know, some black hand guys would show up at your store and they'd say, you know, you're vulnerable here to robbery and extortion. So <laughs> what you have to do is pay us a tax and we'll make sure everything goes okay for you here. And, and in most cases, people paid it willingly um, because they just understood if I don't pay it, they're going to trash my establishment or something bad is going to happen. So it was a kind of a commercial dance that had existed going all the way back to the old country. I think the, the structure of capitalism in the United States in these new these cities that were burgeoning and just growing almost like frontier towns in the early late decades of the 19th century is what we're talking about with the black hand. Um, it was uh, many people saw it as a legitimate form of facilitating commerce in the big city. Uh, it could turn ugly very quickly. Um, if you, if you stood up to the black hand or you bucked the black hand, there could be violent repercussions. The black hand killed people they even killed police officer they killed a cop in kansas city that was quite a scandal back in the late late 19th century and i'm not even talking about the the commissioner of new orleans which was another example of it um so the black hand uh, was a certain kind of uh terror network in the cities um i mentioned the lynching of the sicilians in 1891 in in new orleans i think that is a that is where the where the black hand becomes a much more sophisticated form of operation in the form of the mafia. Um, that lynching played a key, a, a, a key role in the transition from the black hand to the mafia. And the mafia was a more stratified, organized criminal structure. Um, the mafia was more concerned with sort of establishing inroads into the political structure. structure choosing who, polit who would run for office, having politicians in their back pocket that would make it possible for them to uh, do criminal business at a, at a grandiose level that the black hand never could have dreamed of. So um, yeah, that's how the black hand became the mafia. 
So as risque as things could be in New Orleans Storyville, Kansas City Jazz Clubs, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, took things to another level, TJ. Any good examples come to mind involving something called a smoker show? Well, yeah, but before we get to that, I want to I want to establish the context for that sure. that scene in in Kansas City because it is incredible. Um, um, I think a lot of people in the United States have no knowledge that it ever existed, um, but it did. Um, yeah, Kansas City was had a a, a renowned vice district um, and jazz district called the 18th and Vine District. Um, it it was kind of a crossroad city being there in the middle of the country. It was designed to provide forms of entertainment for businessmen who were passing through the city in one direction or another. And so the vice district was pretty evolved and it, it evolved in the way that it did thanks to the political machine that ran the city that was led by a guy named T.J. Pendergast, Thomas T.J. Pendergast who was an old time Irish political boss, uh, the type that existed in many American cities beginning in the early decades of the 20th century, even late 19th century into the 20th century. All of it similar to uh, a political structure called Tammany Hall that some people maybe have heard of that existed in New York. You had a, bit, you had a version of Tammany Hall in many different American cities and you would have a boss like Tom Pendergast he was not the elected official. He, he was what you would call the man behind the man. Tom Pendergast was the guy who chose who ran for political office and got them into power. And everyone paid fealty to the machine. And in K Kansas City was a classic example of it. So vice was allowed to flourish. It was restricted to certain areas. This was the thinking in the early 20th century. Vice is going to exist. If we can't stamp it out, then let's try to uh, sort of control it by centralizing it in one area and let's make money off it to, and then use that money to finance our, our political operations. Kansas City was a classic example of that. Now, gambling was the primary form of vice in these areas by far. It was kind of all about gambling at the time. This is long before Las Vegas existed as a place to go and gamble legally if you wanted to. So there were gambling regions around the United States uh, and vice districts. So um, gambling and prostitution. Um, and where Kansas City kind of expanded on this um, thinking was prostitution as a form of showmanship and entertainment. So the club that you mentioned, um, which the writer Stanley Crouch cites in his biography of Charlie Parker, was a smokers club. Um, musicians would play in strip clubs. Kansas City was known for uh, performers who would do all kinds of things uh, while they were performing. One of the more famous ones is, uh, you know, you would, the, the strippers had their uh, pubic hair trimmed in the shape of different um, playing cards, you know, so like the hearts, and uh, the different playing cards, and they would come over and pick their tips up off the table using their vaginas to do so. Using the um, jelly rolls, huh? Using the jelly rolls to do it. Yeah, now you're getting the hang of it. Um, <laughs> you know, this was part of the early roots of Vice. I, I, I know that there are some contemporary jazz historians who don't like this history and are kind of ashamed of this history, and they, they think that it sheds a bad light on jazz. I don't think so. I, I don't think there's any shame in acknowledging where jazz came from and that this is part of what contributed to the creation of the music. The music was coming up out of the streets. It was existing in a in a, a, an arrangement with uh, mobsters. Um, and the and the truth is at the time, this is what made this is part of what made jazz exciting to a lot of people who came to hear it in a live format. Um, it was the naughtiness of it. It was the underworld aspect of it. And the really good musicians like Jelly Roll Morton and Fats Waller and of course, Duke Ellington, they understood this and they incorporated a lot of the, the mentality, the, 
the I, they knew they were writing and performing music for the underworld. And so the music has that element to it, uh, naughtiness, mysteriousness, dangerousness. This was all part of the draw of, of jazz, especially in the 1920s during Prohibition. Well, I think you're bringing up an important point here, and this goes well beyond the subject of jazz, by the way, that we have become far too scared or worried or concerned about probing too deep into the history or so, of something because they feel or we feel like if we do, then that something becomes cancelable versus understanding that sometimes things start, sometimes things are birthed in dark places but they can rise up from those figurative ashes and become something much more beautiful. And while jazz wasn't necessarily an ugly thing at this time, it was surrounded by some ugliness. I mean, at these smokers shows in Kansas city, for instance, they were playing soundtracks to sexually lewd things going on, straight sex, gay sex, bestiality at times. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't ever listen to jazz as a result. That's just a footnote in the history of this beautiful art form. Yeah, well, um, I think the narrative shows, the historical narrative of jazz shows us, to me, the inspiring thing about it is how jazz rose up out of this milieu exactly. and became what it, what it became. But also to your point, I mean, um, it's so central um, to what I do as a writer. I mean, all of my books are an attempt to go burrow deep into a subject and, and honestly brutally honestly and bring it to the surface and let's air it out and let's examine it you don't get past this history by sanitizing it or burying it and hiding it uh the the it all needs to be out, brought out in the open you know all the all the pus needs to be brought out of the wound for the wound to be able to heal um and that's uh i think the ob part of the obligation of an artist to go deep into it and to bring that out. In a sense, I think the musicians were doing that because let's take Duke Ellington, for example. I mean, we could do this whole podcast about Duke Ellington if we mm -hmm. wanted to. One of the greatest mu musical artists to ever exist in the United States of America. Um, he was the his orchestra was the house band at the Cotton Club in the late 1920s. The Cotton Club was owned by a notorious New York gangster named Oni Madden, Irish roots, um, came to the United States. He was a thug, uh, a, a mob boss in Hell's Kitchen. Um, he rises, prohibition elevates him, and he becomes uh, not only the, the largest bootlegger, quite possibly in the United States of America, but um, he gets, he, he diversifies into sports and entertainment and he buys the cotton club and the cotton club becomes the pinnacle of entertainment in the 1920s they lavish the money on the creation of the floor shows and they hire the best orchestra in the world the duke ellington orchestra so duke ellington is performing in this club that is owned and run by gangsters uh in, in which black people are not allowed in as patrons. It's a segregated club. Many of these clubs were even in the Northern cities, maybe especially in the Northern cities. So the audience was white, but they were coming to Harlem. The club was in Harlem. They were kind of coming to Harlem to slum in black culture, which is kind of how they saw it. The Cotton Club itself, you can tell by the name, was kind of based on the aesthetic of the antebellum South so many of these clubs were the plantation club, the cotton club. They, they were based on the concept of servitude, um, which today uh, is deeply offensive to us looking at it. But at the time, it was the norm and it was accepted. Were those, so, thing, were those things being labeled somewhat ironically or was there some sort of underhanded psychological there was no advantage that was being that was that was uh, attempted to be obtained uh, there was as a result no irony. of comes as clutch. Yeah, there was no irony at all in it. I think what it was was an acknowledgement that jazz in its origins come come came from the south. Mm. Um I mean, New Orleans is a wonderful diverse uh 
maybe the most wonderfully diverse uh, ethnically uh, layered cities in the United States, but it, it is in Louisiana. And Louisiana was the state with the highest number of amount of lynching, by the way. Mm. And um, I guess people still associated jazz with a kind of Southern gentry sort of thing. I mean, it's very disturbing, but again, it's one of these things I think we have to bring out in the open to understand the origins of the music. Um, but as I say, at the time it was the norm and nobody was really questioning it. Right. Um, I do believe that someone like Duke Ellington was astute enough to see it, to recognize it, to see the lay of the land, um, to have a consciousness of what was going on. And so I think he incorporated it into the music. Mm. I think the music is an attempt to take the circumstances of the music, what we were just talking about before, all the dirtiness and naughtiness uh, from the wrong side of the tracks, um, gangster music, mobster music, vice music, I think Duke Ellington took all of that, incorporated it into the music, and then elevated to the music, elevated the music to uh, something as great as anything European classical music ever created. That's what he was doing. That is extraordinary. He was taking the music knowingly from all its nefarious roots, and he wasn't sanitizing it. He was acknowledging all of that and bringing it into the music and then elevating the music compositionally by creating these compositions and pieces of music that were um, unlike anything that had come out of the music before, because he did have a consciousness of classical music and was seeing jazz in those terms. So it's just, why would you ignore the dirty little nefarious roots of jazz? Why would you do that? It's so entertaining. And it's the key to understanding the brilliance of, the, of that music. Duke Ellington, obviously a jazz great. By the way, we'll get into the New York scene more here in just a little bit. Need to shift to the Windy City, though, for a second. Another jazz great, obviously, is Louis Armstrong. Why was it such a big deal in the jazz world, TJ, when Louis went from New Orleans to Chicago in 1922? Yeah, this was a big move. Well, one of the reasons that happened was Storyville was put out of business. The founding fathers closed down Storyville as a vice district in, in 1919, I believe it was, right before Prohibition era sets in. And so it closes down a lot of the clubs, not completely. A lot of them move into the French Quarter and other parts of the city, but it does away with uh, this one, wonderful wonderful vice district that existed in New Orleans. And so a lot of the musicians leave. Um, Louis' mentor, King Oliver, leaves for, before Armstrong does, takes his orchestra to Chicago. And Chicago becomes the place. Jazz is now moving outside of New Orleans. It's going upriver uh, on the showboats in the different cities. And it's developing in other places like Kansas City and St. Louis primarily in Chicago, which becomes the big commercial marketplace for jazz starting around 1922, 23, 24. Um, Louis is summoned by King Oliver to come to play in his band in Chicago. And it's kind of a big deal in the jazz world because people have heard of Louis Armstrong, even though he's just a, he's in his early 20s, 20, 20 years old, something like that. Um, he comes and What's so significant about Armstrong, again, we could do a whole podcast on him, um, musically, of course, what, what, what his talent uh, and his abilities and his drive do to the music of jazz. But um, in terms of this particular book and this study, he's also crucial in terms of this relationship between the musicians and the underworld, mm -hmm. because uh, Armstrong willingly enthusiastically accepts the concept that the clubs and the jazz business are controlled by the criminal element. And if that's the reality um, for an African-American musician venturing out into this business, um, then he's going to get him the biggest, most powerful gangster in this world. Um, he's going to go with it 
in a big way. And that was always his thinking. So when he gets to Chicago and he, he goes to work at a club called the Sunset Cafe, which is partly owned by Al Capone. Al Capone owned about four, had a piece of about four or five different clubs in and around Chicago. Uh, Sunset Cafe was the biggest and most famous. And it was run by uh, an underling of Capone's named Joe Glazer. Joe Glazer was uh, uh, an Ashkenazi Jew who grew up in Chicago and um, was uh, got involved in boxing and in jazz and ran this club. He also was a pimp, supposedly, who ran um, Capone's South Side Bordellos. He was, tri- he was twice prosecuted for statutory rape by uh, getting high on his own supply, uh, as we might say. Um, he, was a, he was a shady character, um, no question about it. He came out of the underworld. He was part of the mob in Chicago and, and made no bones about that or attempts to hide it. Um, he eventually develops on to, into the jazz business side of things and becomes the biggest jazz manager in the history of jazz. He becomes Louis Armstrong's manager and leads Louis to unparalleled levels of success, which makes Glazer attractive to other jazz musicians who become part of his clientele. And this he's is, a legend. This is, this is years after the story that you're telling, though, correct? Yeah, yes. Yeah. This, this, this starts in the 20s, early 20s, and continues on until he dies in 1971. I, I think it was 70 or 71. Um, legendary figure, but um, I mean, Given guys like Joe Glazer, who became so big and powerful in the business and the roots that they had in the underworld, it's not it's not hard to see how the 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 mobster aesthetic became the became the the guiding principle of jazz business. Um, And the fact that Louis Armstrong not only acquiesced to this model, but enthusiastically embraced it, sort of. I think he saw that uh, an African-American musician venturing out into the American marketplace, playing in clubs that were, it was all white people. Um, This was kind of unprecedented for an African-American artist in the United States um, to succeed in this way and at this level. And it was, had the, had had a flip side to it, which was that it would, it was potentially perilous violence, extortion being taken advantage of in any number of ways. And so um, Armstrong kind of recognized and believed that um, he needed, he needed, uh, he needed a a big, bad, badass mobster uh, fronting for him. And he adhered to that principle throughout his entire career. And by the way, he had good judgment too, because as much of a scumbag as Glazer was, he also had some serious balls, including standing up to Al Capone, of all people, at one point in support of. Well, there's a few examples of of of, of Satchmo having to deal with this. Um, one the famous one is um, where he touched off a management war a manager in, in Chicago, uh, represented by Dutch Schultz, the mo- maybe the most powerful gangster in New York at the time, believed they owned a piece of him. And the uh, the outfit in Chicago, led by Al Capone, believed they owned a piece of him. And two powerful managers were involved in this. And one night, um, Armstrong was playing at a club in Chicago, and he was visited after his gig by a, 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 a gangster named um, Foster. I think it was Jim Foster. I'm not sure the first name. Um, a very prominent local gangster who came to him and said, Hey, you know, I've been sent here by people in New York and you're, you're scheduled to play at Connie in Connie's in nightclub tomorrow night in New York. And he's like, I can't do that. I'm booked here at the showboat, this club in Chicago for the next few nights. And Foster pulled out a gun and cocked the gun and said, no, you have a gig in Mm -hmm. New York. Um, And so this was exactly why um, Satchmo felt that he needed this kind of protection. Unfortunately, he had gotten, you know, involved in a number of different combines in different cities, criminal combines. And so he kind of fell into the abyss between these two organizations. 
it motivated his leaving the United States and living and playing in Europe for two years. And he didn't come back until Al Capone was murdered in 1935, notoriously murdered, famously murdered in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, the picture of his dead body slumped over a table in a restaurant in New Jersey was on the front page of newspapers all across the United States. It was only after that that Armstrong came back. He came back to the United States. Within a week of that murder, he, por he performed at Connie's Inn Club, which had now moved from Harlem to Times Square. And the song he sang that night was, I'll be glad when you're dead, you rascal, you. Hmm. which was one of his big hits. But I always get the feeling that song must have had extra meaning to him when he was singing it after the murder of Dutch Schultz. Yeah, what a phenomenal middle finger there. Now, what was Al Capone's relationship with jazz and its musicians like in Chicago during Prohibition, as exemplified by a story involving Scarface and the renowned pianist Fats Waller? Uh, Capone loved the music. Uh, he was he he loved he loved opera also. I, I always think of it as opera representing his Italian side and jazz representing his American side. He loved jazz. He was a patron of the clubs. He didn't just own them. He showed up to listen to the music all the time. He'd come in with an entourage and he'd supposedly spread money around. He'd request songs and uh, hand out a twenty here, a twenty there. Um, the musicians liked him for that reason. Um, he So Fats Waller, who's from Harlem in New York, was one of the few musicians who was renowned enough that he could travel to different cities and headline uh, uh, gigs in different cities. So he was in Chicago. He's playing in Chicago. Capone saw him perform and just fell in love with Fats Waller. And uh, for those of you who don't know or don't have a clear sense of who Fats Waller was, let me recommend the internet because you can Google Fats Waller's name and you can bring up a lot of clips of his performances. He was in movies also, um, just a phenomenal entertainer. We, we talked about Jelly Roll Morton. Fats Waller is kind of the evolution of that style of jazz performer who sits down at the piano, he, he mugs and makes faces and, He's probably a little bit high when he's performing and just an incredible performer, riveting, entertaining. You listen to his music with a smile on your face, just as you would with Louis Armstrong. Um, so it's understandable that that um, Capone fell for Fats Waller, supposedly as the story goes. And, and Fats Waller is the one who would tell this story often in the years that followed the following night. As he finished his gig, a couple of hoodlums in the Capone organization came up to him and at gunpoint said to him, look, don't make a scene. Uh, you're finished here at this club, so you're coming with us. We're going to take you to Cicero, which is a suburb of Chicago, was a, uh, Capone's base of operations. They said, we're going to take you to Cicero. We're going to put you up in a nice hotel there. And you are going to be the surprise entertainment at a birthday party for Al Capone that's going to stretch over the weekend, starting tonight, Friday night, and on, on in till Sunday. And uh, Waller was scared shitless because, you know, this was at gunpoint. They kidnapped him, basically. They kidnapped him out of that club. They took him to Cicero. They put him up in a hotel. He proceeded to provide the entertainment for the party. Al Capone was thrilled when he saw that Fats Waller was there. They lavished... Waller with cash over the course of this weekend. He claims that he left there on Sunday to go back to New York with $3,000 in cash in his pocket. I mean, that's the equivalent of at least about $30,000 today, probably, probably more than that. And he had a great story to tell uh, for the rest of his life. That is incredible. And you also do a good job of explaining why Fats was so good at handling gangsters, but people are going to need to purchase and read uh, this book to learn about that. Now, Chapter 5, TJ, is titled Birth of the Hipster. So what was the birth of the hipster? Birth of the hipster goes to the, the origins of the term hip. I mean, I've read a lot of things over the years. It's one of those terms like jazz 
you hear a lot of different explanations for where it might have co come from. The explanation that seems the most logical to me was um, when prohibition was instituted, uh, it was illegal to sell alcohol, to produce or sell alcohol. And so what sprang up in a lot of cases were clubs where people would come to hear the music and they would bring their own booze with them and they would bring it in a hip flask hmm. and the hip flask would be on their person. And of course, this was all surreptitious. You know, it was not out in the open. This was illegal. And so someone would come up to you maybe and whisper to your ear, are you hip? Are, are you hip? Are you hip meant, are you carrying a hip flask with booze? <laughs> um, so that was the origin of that tip, that term. And then, then, then it became a hipster. A hipster was someone who was hip enough to be carrying a hip flask in a jazz club so that they could drink and get high uh, at, at, while the music was going on. So the hipster started there and then it became a whole, let's face it, a whole... Um, a whole culture unto itself. Yeah. A hipster became um, people who circul circulate in the jazz realm, who speak, who speak the lingo of the jazz world and operate within uh, a kind of cultural underworld of jazz. So they smoke muggles, which is what you called marijuana. And if you were someone who smoked muggles, you were a viper. A viper was a marijuana user. Um, you were hip to a lot of things that the average citizen was not hip to. This became part of the attraction of jazz. And um, that term stuck to jazz for a long time. I would say right up until the 1960s when the term hip or hipster became, uh, was uh, bastardized to become hippie. A hippie is something totally different than a hipster, but oh, I think I, I never realized that they started to, that in the 1960s. They, they used that term to signify hippies. That's interesting. Well, I think that that's where the term comes from. I think it was a variation on hip, hippie, um, and so that term started to mean something else completely. And today, you know, the term hipster is used to describe millennials. Uh, oh, yeah. You've got to have an ironic T-shirt, wear horned rim glasses and pay way too much for your coffee to be called a hipster. Yeah, hipster is not really a cool thing. Now, it's more of a pejorative term. Um, <laughs> but for the longest time, to be a hipster in the jazz realm was the coolest thing of all. In fact, I'll, I'll mention this now. Um, the, the book Really the Blues, which is a memoir by Mez Mesro was published in the late 1940s. Mez Mesro was a musician and a marijuana dealer, prominent marijuana dealer in the jazz world in the 20s and 30s and on into the 40s. He was a white guy whose mission in life was to absorb black culture and to be as close to a black jazz musician as he could possibly be. Given what Norman he, Mailer called uh, the white Negro in a 1957 essay. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, Mesro felt so strongly about this that when he winds up doing a stint in jail on narcotics charges and uh, they put him in, of course, they put him in the, the white wing. The prisons are segregated at that time. He comes to prison officials and says, I think you've made a mistake. You know, you have me with the white inmates. I'm not white. And <laughs> he was so convincing in his explanation of that, that they put him in the black section of the prison, the only white guy in the black section of the prison. Wow. Anyway, he he defines the term hipster and, and really um, details it beautifully in that book. In fact, there's a glossary in the back of the book that has all this terminology from that time that which he he defines the meaning of all these different words. It's a very useful document just for that alone. But it's also a beautiful little book for capturing the flavor of the mob infiltration of the jazz business world. Um, he became fed up with it eventually. You know, it, it started in Chicago and it was one of the reasons he left Chicago. He said Capone and the whole gangster realm is annoying to him. And so he fled to New York and he found out it was just as prevalent in New York. 
gangster control of the jazz world. And he lived within that and dealt with it for a long time. And he, he finally, he finally kind of, I think drove him a little bit crazy ultimately. And he was a white musician. Imagine what that dynamic might've been if you were an African-American musician having to deal with it. He is TJ English. The new book is Dangerous Rhythms, Jazz in the Underworld. This is part one of our conversation. Stay tuned for part two. We talk about how jazz thrived even through the Great Depression, the pivot required by the world of gangsters. Uh, once prohibition came to an end of the early 1930s, it involved jukeboxes and a whole lot more, including Frank Sinatra and his complicated relationship with both the jazz and gangster worlds you're listening to books on pod check out more episode at booksonpod.com until the next time i'm trey elling good day